Some of you may already know I've been working on this game on my second channel, and parts of this game are built with Angular. Like this power bar here, which reacts to the user clicking and holding. As the user holds the mouse down, this bar will animate showing the power level, and it also subtly increases in size and brightness as the power bar grows as well. When the player releases the mouse, the power bar disappears and whatever power level they got is shown on the screen. This is actually an Angular component too, but for this video I just wanted to focus on this power bar component. There's some interesting things going on in here. We have this custom directive, some host bindings with signals for the animation. It's making use of both two observable and two signal, some RxJS operators, output from observable. But most importantly, this is all done declaratively which is primarily why I thought this might be useful to look at. It's a non-trivial component and is typical of the sort of declarative code in Angular that I usually write. I have enough videos where I yap about how great declarative code is and specifically what it is, and that's not what I'm aiming to do here. But at least so we're on the same page, by declarative in this context, I mean that this code never reassigns any declarations, there are no effects or callbacks that change the value of something imperatively, Everything you need to know about any one of these declarations and how it changes over time is contained within the declaration itself, which, at least for me, is the key benefit of declarative code. It makes the code easier to understand and extend because all related code is co-located and any dependencies are explicitly stated. So let's take a look at how this component works. From the outside, the API is basic enough. We plop this power bar component into the template, and we can pass in a single input to control whether the bar should be disabled. This is so that after the player has thrown the spear for example, they can't trigger the power bar again until the spear has reset. It also has two outputs, one that emits every time the power level changes, so we get a constant stream of values as it increases, and one that emits just when the user releases the mouse. So now let's take a peek under the hood. We'll just go from the top down, and maybe this will also serve as a demonstration of how the declarative approach can make it quicker and easier to understand code you haven't seen before, or perhaps just code you haven't seen in three weeks. First, we have this custom directive, which isn't strictly required, nor does it have anything really to do with declarative code here. This is more of a style choice because we could just bind these styles directly to the span in the power bar component template. But with the directive approach, I am creating this input on the directive for the current power level. And then I also make that input the selector for the directive. So now if I supply this power input on the span, it serves a dual purpose of being the selector that will attach the directive's functionality to the span. But it also behaves as the input itself for us to pass the value in. Every time the power input signal changes, these host bindings will update and all the styles will update appropriately. So that the directive is available to this component, we do need to make sure to include it in the imports array. There is also a host binding for the component itself, which is what toggles the power bar's visibility based on whether or not it is active. We have some more styles here, of course, but this is pretty generic progress bar CSS styling, so I'm going to skip through that. And now we get into RxJS territory, and where I'm hoping to demonstrate the value of declarative code. Readability has a lot to do with familiarity, and for anyone not familiar with RxJS operators, they might balk at the idea that this is supposedly more readable and easier to understand than more imperative style code. But let me do a little magic trick and make all the unfamiliarity disappear. This is what declarative code is, the rest is just implementation details that you can become familiar with. We can trivially read through this to get a sense of how this works and what things depend on. We have a power bar disabled declaration that comes from the input. We have a power bar active declaration that is triggered by a left click. We have a power bar amount declaration that is derived from whether the power bar is active or not. We have a power updated output that is triggered by the power bar amount changing. And we have this power released output, which is also somehow triggered by the power bar amount changing. This gives us the big picture architecture of how the code works and how it is all connected and then we can easily direct our attention to anything specifically we need to know more about. Often with declarative code, we don't even have to know how something works. If I need to add some new feature that depends on the current power bar amount, I can just pipe off of that stream without caring about its implementation details. So let's see precisely how this power bar active works. 
This is where we get into the territory of needing to understand how RxJS works, but I don't think this style of code is inherently more difficult to understand than imperative code. For a lot of people, it's just less familiar. Arguably, RxJS code is much more descriptive. This example is actually on the more complex side for what might be typically required. But as someone who is familiar with RxJS, this code reads much more nicely to me than an imperative equivalent would. I can see this declaration represents whether or not the power bar is active, but suppose I need to know how specifically that is derived. Every time a left click is triggered, we get the latest value from power bar disabled. Using that value, we want to switch to a different stream. If the power bar is disabled, then we want to just switch to an empty stream, meaning nothing should be emitted if the power bar is disabled. If it isn't disabled, then we want to switch to the mouse up or click released stream. When this happens, we will start with a value of true, indicating that the left click or mouse down event has happened. And then we wait, and when the mouse up event emits, we will change that value to false, indicating that the mouse is no longer being held down. So we start with a mouse down event, emit some value, wait until we get a mouse up event and emit some other value. So our power bar active will be true as long as the mouse is being held down and the power bar hasn't been disabled. Now this power bar amount declaration is very atypical and I would very rarely need to do something like this. But it is interesting and also shows just how flexible RxJS and declarative code can be. The general idea here is that we react to the power bar active declaration becoming true, i.e. the mouse is being held down. What we are aiming to do is have this power bar amount increase from 0 to 100 for as long as power bar active is true. To do that, we make use of this animation frame stream that basically emits when the browser request animation frame would be triggered. That's a separate topic that I won't go into here, but the general idea is that it is triggered just before a browser paint to keep updates as efficient as possible. Animation frames from RxJS gives us this elapsed value so we know how long it has been since the first emission was triggered. And we can use that to calculate our total value for how long the power bar has been active for. Since 100 is our max value, we unsubscribe from the stream once that value is reached. Output from Observable is great here as we can easily create an output that emits every time one of our streams change, which is what I'm doing here for power updated. The power released output is a bit more complicated because I only want that to be triggered once the user releases the mouse. Since the power is reset back to zero when the user releases the mouse, what I am doing here is using pairwise, which will give me both the current and previous values from the power bar amount stream. I know that if the current value is zero, then the previous value must have been whatever the released value was. So I just emit that value. I also have a minimum power requirement of at least 10, so I filter out anything less than that. So that's about it for this component. I hope this little showcase was helpful or interesting to you in some way. If you feel so inclined, a like or subscribe before you go would be greatly appreciated, and I hope to see you back here again.